All right. Um, where we left off was um, with lattice energy. We were about to talk about lattice energy, uh, which um, is the energy that's released when um, <clears throat> positive and negative ions form the three-dimensional network, which is how they are normally found. Um, in forming this network, they reach uh, some extra stability, and that results in the release of energy. This is these uh, three-dimensional networks or lattices can be formed because, uh, as we've mentioned before, ionic attractions are not directional. Um, when a um, covalent bond forms, it's very directional, meaning that um, for a covalent bond, uh, the covalent bond only consists of two atoms, and for there to be a bond between them, they those two atoms have to share valence electrons that are basically housed between the two nuclei of those two atoms. And that's a directional bond. Whereas ionic attractions are what are known as non-directional bonds. And that is that the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions sort of radiates in out from the ions in um, you know, uh, all three dimensions. And so a positive ion will be attracted to a negative ion that's say to the right, but also to the left, and also in front, and also in back, and also above, and also below. And you know, vice versa for negative ions attracted to positive ions. And so because of these attractions, uh, they're actually, uh, ions are actually most stable when they're arranged in this three-dimensional lattice. Okay, the, um, the crystal is more stable or lower in energy than individual ions. And an example of that is ionizing sodium to Na plus and chlorine to Cl minus releases, um, basically uh, requires energy input. But forming the lattice from Na plus and Cl minus releases energy. Okay, and the overall process releases energy overall. So the amount of energy you have to put in to ionize the sodium and the chlorine is actually relatively small than uh, compared to the energy that's released when the lattice forms. And the fact that this overall process releases more energy than it takes in means that the process overall is spontaneous. If you take a piece of sodium and some chlorine gas and put them in the same container together, they will spontaneously form sodium chloride. And that's because overall, the energy released when the lattice forms is greater than the energy that has to be put in to get the ions to form in the first place. And that means that sodium chloride crystals have lower energy and therefore are more stable than sodium metal and chlorine gas separately. And the energy released on lattice formation is what's known as the lattice energy. <clears throat> okay, so the lattice energy is technically for a more formal de definition. <clears throat> 
it's the energy released by forming a three-dimensional lattice of positive and negative ions in the gas state, of course, as it usually is. And in this process, the reason that it require, that it results in a release of energy is that, well, the ions are stabilized by the presence of oppositely charged ions around them. Um, in more technical terms, what that means is the potential energy decreases as the positive and negative ions approach each other. This is according to Coulomb's law. And the energy is usually released as heat. Today we, uh, uh, usually use what's known as the Born-Haber cycle to calculate lattice energy. Whoops. And it's um, actually a hypothetical series of steps that uh, represent the formation of ionic compounds from their elements. And the change in energy is known for all of the steps. except one. <clears throat> and that last one is the lattice energy. That is the one that's not known. And from that, we can use Hess's law to calculate the lattice energy. And we haven't had Hess's law yet because actually that was in one of the chapters that we've skipped. Uh, although we are, no, wait a minute. Um, that chapter, come to think of it, is uh, chapter six, I believe. And that's the one that's gonna be covered next semester or next session. So uh, actually, we won't get to talk about uh, Hess's law in this session. Uh, Hess's law states that um, when it comes to uh, energy changes during chemical reactions, if you want to find the energy change in a, a chemical reaction where the energy change has not been measured before, or where, say, change, um, measuring the energy change would be especially difficult for some reason, what you can do instead to get a pretty good approximation of the energy change for that reaction is to find a bunch of several other chemical reactions that can sort of algebraically add up to the reaction that you're interested in. And if you can do that, then the energy changes for those reactions will also algebraically add up to the energy of the um, reaction you're interested in. That's essentially what Hess's law says. So what we've got here is a series of hypothetical steps um, of uh, ions combining with each other 
and one of those steps represents the formation of the lattice between the opposite, uh, oppositely charged ions. And so essentially you have to get a bunch of reactions where you do know the changes in energies and um, arrange them in a way that they sort of algebraically add up so that you're getting the product um, products that you would want or that you would get from the formation of the lattice. And then if you can add up the energy changes for those different processes, you'll have your lattice energy. <clears throat> Uh, the lattice energy is usually a large negative number. So it's usually a large negative number, and it's enough to uh, Uh, basically enough to uh, overwhelm or cancel out the positive values of the ionizations. And then some. So the end result, remember negative tends to mean spontaneous, in terms of energy changes, negative means energy is released and um, processes that release energy tend to be spontaneous, whereas positive means energy is taken in and processes like that tend not to be spontaneous. So if the process with the negative energy change overwhelms the process with the positive energy change, what that means is the lattice formation tends to be spontaneous. Okay. There are some trends in lattice energy, as you might expect, and those trends have to do, well, basically with Coulomb's law. Uh, the trends have to do with how big the ions are. So in other words, how close together can the positive and negative charges get? And also they have to do with the magnitude of the charges, both positive and negative. So for trends in lattice energies, first we have ion sizes. So the lattice energy tends to be less negative as the ion size increases. Uh, down a group. And that's just because the, the um, distance between the ions increases. <clears throat> uh, the trend for ion charge is that uh, the lattice energy is more negative remember more negative means basically more spontaneous as the ion charge increases And again, that's uh, due to Coulomb's law. And Coulomb, remember that Coulomb's law was E equals 
a constant. One over four pi epsilon zero or epsilon naught or whatever. Times Q1 times Q2 over R. And so here you can actually see both of these trends at work here. Energy is proportional to the product of the charges of the two um, charged items or ions in this case. So the bigger those numbers are, the bigger E is going to be. Energy is inversely proportional to the distance between the charges. And so as the ions get bigger and the center of the charges gets further and further apart from each other, the energy is going to go down. And let's see. Um, uh, so let's see. A comparison between model and reality for ionic bonding. The model of an ionic solid is of a lattice of ions held together by columbic forces, that is electrostatic attractions, in other words. Uh, forces. <clears throat> uh, that are equal in all directions. Okay, this uh, requires a lot of energy. Uh, so basically, um, these forces have to be overcome in order to melt an ionic uh, solid. To melt an ionic solid, these forces must be overcome. Because melting is essentially uh, taking the particles in a solid and pulling them apart enough that they can move around and past one another, or in other words, become a liquid. Because that's what distinguishes solid from liquids. In solids, the particles are more or less fixed in place. They can vibrate, but they can't move around and past one another. In a liquid, the particles are able to move around and past one another. In order to get from solid to liquid with an ionic substance, you have to be able to at least partially overcome the electrostatic attractions between the oppositely charged ions. So in other words, in order to melt an ionic solid, these um, forces that hold the ions together must be overcome at least partially. These forces are very strong though, So overcoming them, overcoming those forces requires a lot of energy. Or in other words, if you're going to try to do it with heat, it requires a lot of heat. In other, other words, that means that the melting point of ionic solids should be very high. And in fact, that's true. Ionic solids do have very high melting points compared to covalently bonded solids. Covalently bonded solids tend to have relatively low uh, melting points. And in fact, a lot of covalently bonded solids are already 
liquids at room temperature. They don't even need to be melted. Another way that we can check the models uh, of ionic bonding against reality would be uh, that the model of ionic bonding says, that electrons are transferred from metal to non-metal. But remain localized on one atom. It's just that the atom on which the electrons are localized changes. <clears throat> so the electron starts out on the metal, it ends up on the nonmetal. But in both instances, it belongs uh, to one atom and one atom only. And the lack of free arranging electrons means that as long as it's solid, an ionic substance should not conduct electricity. And in fact, they don't. That's true. Uh, when dissolved in water or melted, <clears throat> um, cations and anions come apart. and the free ions can conduct electricity. And that's according to the model, and actually that's true. So the model stands up to scrutiny is what we're saying here. Okay, that's a good overview of ionic bonding. The next section is on covalent bonding. And how we can use Lewis structures to envision covalent bonding. Okay, so remember what covalent bonding is. In this case, the name really kind of says it all. Covalent means that two atoms are sharing their valence shell of electrons. Covalent, they're putting their valence shells together. So neighboring atoms will be sharing some or all valence electrons. Hence covalent. With the goal of achieving octets around the various atoms within the uh, molecules that form. Uh, remembering that, of course, for hydrogen and helium, we're looking for duets rather than octets. So looking at covalent bonding, <clears throat> 
we'll start with single bonds and work our way up. Single bond is a sharing of one pair of valence electrons. And in most cases, uh, basically you'll have one electron of that pair coming from, uh, what, from each atom that's involved in the bond. A very simple situation would be diatomic elements. The simplest of all, of course, being hydrogen. For hydrogen, each hydrogen atom has one electron. Hydrogen wants a duet that is two electrons around it. Well, by pooling their one electrons together between the atoms, uh, actually the electrons that are involved in a, in a covalent bond can be counted as being on both atoms at the same time. So essentially, this hydrogen with its electron sort of uh, combines resources with this hydrogen and its electron, and you end up with this as the Lewis structure for the hydrogen molecule. For in this case, you can um, look at the electrons on the hydrogen on the left, and you have two electrons. Look at the electrons in the hydrogen around the hydrogen on the, on the right, and you've also got two electrons. So both hydrogens are happy at the same time now because they pulled their, their one electron. And this, the two electrons between the atoms, that is the covalent bond. Two electrons being shared is one covalent bond or a single covalent bond. And you can also write a Lewis structure like this with a straight line between the two atoms that are being bonded representing the, uh, the bond. And it really depends uh, which way you write it really depends on what you want to emphasize. If you write it this way with two dots representing the bond, then you're representing, uh, you're sort of emphasizing the electrons. How many electrons are there? Where are they? Um, what are they doing? If you write it this way, you're emphasizing the bond, the fact that there's one bond in this molecule, and that running it this way emphasizes that that bond consists of two electrons. Either way is correct. It just really depends on uh, what aspect of the molecule you're interested in. There are bigger, more complicated diatomic elements. And I just want to emphasize that those dots are not electrons. <laughs> uh, so you've got bromine. That's a diatomic element also. Each bromine has seven electrons. Drawing them like this kind of emphasizes what's going to happen. <clears throat> This, the odd electron on this bromine and the odd electron on this bromine are going to come together and form a covalent bond between the two bromines. And you will have a situation like this. <clears throat> the electrons on the left-hand bromine can include those that are involved in the bond with the other bromine. And so now the bromine on the left has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. And the bromine on the right can also claim the electrons that are involved in the bond to the other bromine. And the bromine on the right has two, four, six, eight electrons around it at the same time. So both bromines have octets simultaneously, and that makes them much more stable. <clears throat> 
this structure could also be written like this with a straight line representing the bond. And again, it just uh, depends on what you want to emphasize. If you want to emphasize that there's one bond, then you draw it uh, the way I drew it on the right. If you want to emphasize that that one bond involves two electrons, then you would draw it the way I drew it on the left. Also with uh, this structure, we see our first um, distinction between the types of electrons that you can find in Lewis structures. Notice that two of the electrons in this example are involved in a bond. And that would be known as a bonding pair of electrons or just bonding electrons. But there are also lots of electrons around the edge that are not involved in bonds. Those are known as non-bonding or lone pair electrons. And also, you know, th these electrons here and these and these and these would also be lone pair electrons or non-bonding electrons. And so those are sometimes important to distinguish from each other for certain purposes. <clears throat> um, you can get into compounds. For example, H2O. Uh, if you have a hydrogen with one electron, and an oxygen with six electrons, which I am distributing strategically because I know what's coming. Drawing it like this, it's kind of obvious how these uh, atoms come together. And in fact, we know that the oxygen is in the middle uh, we, because we've seen the structure of oxygen before and the hydrogens are on the outside. For one thing, hydrogen, because it's only got one electron, hydrogen can only form one bond. And so hydrogen will never be in the middle of a molecule. It's always at the end of a molecule. Uh, and oxygen ends up being the only thing that can be in the middle here. So what we end up with is a structure that looks like this. Or, like this. Notice that if you uh, try to total up how many electrons everything has, the hydrogen, if you count the electrons that are shared with the atom next door, which you should, the hydrogen has two electrons on it. Oxygen has eight, and the other hydrogen also has two. And so hydrogen wants a duet. Each hydrogen here has a duet. Oxygen wants a, uh, an octet, and oxygen has an octet. Notice also that we uh, have bonding electrons here. These electrons between the hydrogen and oxygen are bonding electrons. So we've actually got two pairs of bonding electrons. But the electrons that are not involved in bonds, those are the ones above the oxygen and below it, those would be lone pair electrons. So in this one, we have two bonding pairs and two lone pairs in that molecule. <clears throat> okay, uh, next we'll get into double and triple bonds, but I see we're out of time for this lecture, so we'll have to leave that for next time. Try not to be too disappointed. Uh, okay, so I'll see you then.